So far in this unit, we've been looking at the history of West Asia. In this last week before the first exam, we're going to take a shallow look at the history of the Mediterranean, the large body of water just to the west of West Asia. One of the things I hope you get out of these upcoming lectures is that the Mediterranean was completely indebted to the cultures of West Asia for its writing, for its mathematics, and for a lot of its actual culture. And while we're not going to be talking about Europe very much in this class, it is worth noting that Europe got its culture from the Mediterranean. So in many ways, European culture is directly tied to the West Asian culture that we've been studying thus far. This is a map of the Mediterranean at the end of the 3rd century BCE. At this point, it was still an area that was ruled over by many different states, though, as you'll be seeing, their cultures were pretty intricately linked. A quick word on that term, Mediterranean. Mediterranean simply means Middle Earth. This type of assumption that they were the center of the world wasn't just a feature of the Mediterranean. As we'll see in China, they often refer to themselves as the Middle Kingdom. In South Africa, there was a people who called themselves the Khoi Khoi, which simply translates as the real people. This belief that one's own group is the center of the world, we often refer to this as ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism is a word that you should know. The history of the Mediterranean really doesn't start in earnest until after the Bronze Age collapse. That collapse didn't have the same effect everywhere. You might remember that the kingdom of Hatti completely crumbled. Egypt wavered for nearly a century after the Brog collapse, then itself did fragment. In Mycenaean Greece, the devastation was apocalyptic. Most major cities burned to the ground, and many villages completely disappeared. It seems that many of the survivors of the collapse turned to nomadic lifestyles. If there's a silver lining to all this, the surviving cities within the Levant found themselves temporarily freed from their Hittite and their Egyptian overlords, particularly the cities of Phoenicia. In the Iron Age, lead families, lead aristocratic families from Phoenician city-states started sending out colonists, members of their own families, to set up ports all along northern Africa and southern Iberia, modern-day Spain right down here. These colonies acted as way stations for ships, so resupply depots. They collected new resources within the areas that they settled. And of course, they opened up markets amongst the locals within that area. The largest of these cities was Carthage, over in the western portion of North Africa. For the first few centuries of its existence, Carthage was tied to the city-state of Tyr. It was part of the Tyr trading network. But sometime around the year 600 BCE, Carthage gained its independence. Much of this, of course, had to do with the Babylonian and later on Persian conquests of the Phoenician city-states. Once Carthage gained its independence, it claimed hegemony over the other western Phoenician colonies of the Mediterranean. Hegemony essentially means overlordship. This is an empire that they created, but it is not a militaristic empire. They don't have their own governors out working across the different colonies. This is a trading empire where Carthage got to set the rules of trade. And I want to emphasize the Phoenicians weren't just traders, they were explorers. They explored all the way up to Britain. They explored the West African coast, possibly actually making it all the way around Africa. We have a couple reports of such in the ancient Mediterranean world. And they traded all over the northern Mediterranean, even if they didn't claim it as their own land. This included post-apocalyptic Greece.